Hi. Ähm, ja, das ist die Woods hier. Äh, wir sind auf Laser Gruppenland, dem deutschen Minecraft-Server. Also, der wird in Deutschland gehostet. Ihr könnt natürlich auch von woanders herkommen, ne? Äh, lol. Äh, mit der IP 149.202.127.134 gratis erreichbar hier und äh, wahrscheinlich auch noch für längere Zeit. Ähm, wir schauen uns heute an von DEFCON 21 von 2013 äh, von dem lieben Herrn Matsch äh, den Talk Unexpected Stories from a Hacker Inside the Government äh, und wie beim letzten Mal werde ich das auf meinem Zweitbildschirm äh, zweit Laptop hier pumpen diesmal und äh, wir sind immer noch am Laptop Setup okay. wir werden wahrscheinlich nicht die ganze Episode schaffen äh, weil ich in 40 Minuten weg... Ja, mal sehen. Okay. Okay. Ich war hier vorher schon ein bisschen drauf gehabt und hier festgestellt, dass wenn man die Partikel aus hat, dann sieht man das von den, von den Hühnern nicht, diese Herzen und so. And there are four stories I'm going to tell you that all have some kind of unexpected outcomes and unexpected twists. You've probably heard about some of these stories Boy, in the media, but these are kind of different back origins to them that you haven't heard before. I'll do my best ja, to think be as accurate as possible, so. but I'm going from memory from some of these, and some of these go back several years. Uh, memory is not perfect, so I apologize in advance. <coughs> so... I'm not trying to piss off or be pro or con any particular community, but I want understandings, which is why I'm trying to tell these kind of uh, non-obvious stories. Somebody had tweeted me something uh, encouraging me to do this talk, saying anything we can do to help people understand each other is good, because of course prejudice is, um, is bred from ignorance and exclusion, so you can kind of consider this my transparency slash trip report from uh, Three years inside the video. <laughs> Not long after I started working at Dark Hunt, I got funding approval for the first of one of many programs uh, that I would actually run. I, I know most folks are only familiar with a few of them. The first program was something called Cinder, and it was focused on super evolved advanced persistent traffic. And a program that had nothing to do with whistleblowers, had nothing to do with humans. It was targeting autonomous software. Now, there was an author uh, at Forbes magazine, Andy Greenberg, who found out that Julian Assange and I uh, knew each other and have kind of known each other for, I don't know, like 20 plus years. Uh, and he wrote an article uh, that, the way I read the article, attempted to pit me and Julian against each other, claiming that Cinder was a response to WikiLeaks. You know, a sexy story of hacker friends, you know, who now find themselves at odds, one trying to spill the government secrets, one trying to protect the government secrets. Yeah, that's a sexy story. The problem is it's entirely untrue because Tinder had nothing to do with that. So since he and other folks wanted to kind of make a story about me and Julian where there was no story before, I figured I'd tell you an actual story about me and Julian. <clears throat> This first story is called How the DoD un Unintentionally Created WikiLeaks. So it was 2009, I had yet to uh, uh, go into DARPA. Uh, I was over in Germany for the CCC Congress, which by the way is awesome. And by the way, Berlin is freezing in December. So it's a couple blocks from the hotel over to the Congress and I braved it across. It takes about like 10, 15 minutes before your lips come back and you can actually start to form words again. So there's this talk that I wanted to see at the Congress and I watched it, it was great. There was a gap between the next talk that I wanted to see and the whole decision was do I go back to the hotel and go out in the frigid Berlin um, you know, winter or do I find something else to kind of pass the time? It's CCC, it's easy to find things to pass the time there. Um, and there was a talk that was going on about WikiLeaks. Remember, 2009, no State Department cables, no nothing like that at this point. WikiLeaks had been around, but it wasn't kind of in the popular vernacular. It wasn't a household name. So 
Was ich denn hier, wie lange das schon läuft? Ah, hier, vier Minuten. Sorry. Ja, ich war auf der Universität. 
doing my graduate work, um, something essentially fundamental research, which means something to the government folks. And he said it was funded, you know, by the U.S. government. It was a grant, you know, from like NSA type DARPA sort of funding. I don't know if those were the actual agencies. And he said it was during that time period where there was a big pullback from the DOD. And the message that the universities received was, we're not funding you to, to do basic research anymore. It's all classified now. His work got rolled up in that. Now, whether that was actually why it was being pulled back or if that was just the perceived message, I don't know. So if you think about it, here's a non-US citizen who's changed, who's, who's, who's made a life decision, go to graduate work, go you know, kind of leave the community that, that we knew him in, um, and all of a sudden, uh, his funding gets pulled, and he's told that he's not allowed to know what it was that he was doing, not allowed to know what it was that he had, you know, discovered, and no extra, ex actual reason as to why the funding is. I mean, that's kind of what it's like when you're a graduate student and somebody pulls your funding, sort of thing. And this just really, really rubbed it wrong. He said, this is the wrong reason for classification, if that's why he lost his funding. This is designed to keep people um, ignorant and withhold information um, to keep folks disadvantaged. And so at that point, that he decided that he was going to devote his life to exposing people who tried to keep secrets, and hence WikiLeaks was born. So uh. when folks in the DoD would ask me, "Hey, you know, do you know this you know, WikiLeaks thing, and and what are your thoughts on on how we could like you know address it?" They were a little surprised with my answer, going, "Well, you know, by some accounts, the government actually created it in the first place." It was at, at that point during the night uh, at the, in the, the restaurant, Julian goes, well, so, you know, that's what I've been doing for the past 10 years. You know, what are you up to? I said, oh, I'm about to go work at DARPA. <laughs> so that's my first story. Second story um, is about Anonymous and the Department of Defense. I remember Anonymous from way back. I mean, Anonymous, I use it as like, you know, a, a proper noun, but obviously we're, we're all familiar and it's much more, it's, it's kind of a movement of thought, you know, it's a, more ephemeral uh, than that. And when I remember them, they, you know, they were going after Scientology and RIAA and there was all the 4chan sort of soap opera stuff uh, going on. And at some point, um, their scope or the target, you know, uh, expanded to include the government <coughs> and general wisdom was that the triggering event was the DOD's response to WikiLeaks and Manning, et cetera. Uh, but the way I saw it, there was actually something else that was a bit more subtle that folks hadn't uh, realized. So in 2011, the DOD released the strategy for operating in cyberspace. There was some very minor backlash to some of the wording initially. I think there was an initial you know, small leaked version of it. Uh, that that went out and it was followed by a later one. Uh, but there was some more specific backlash and chatter uh, in the hacker researcher community. The strategy stated that the DOD was going to you know, treat cyberspace as domain to conduct operations in. And it appeared kind of modeled off of outer space, you know, treating space as, you know, these are DOD-ish words, a, a domain. And there were some confused conversations going, well, why is anybody upset if you treat cyberspace as a domain? You know, there wasn't that much upset with uh, treating space. And, you know, nobody lives in cyberspace, which you could have kind of only hear inside the government, like a statement like that. Because if you think about it, you know, we all live in cyberspace. And the hacker researcher community made it their, you know, made cyberspace, I'm really not a fan of that word. <laughs> made the internet and, you know, online, you know, uh, our homes well before the government and everybody else kind of made it just, you know, where they always lived and did everything in. So if you send a message that, you know, that's somebody's backyard and that you're going to militarize and, you know, prep for war in somebody's backyard, that can sound really scary. And it can galvanize folks to respond. One of the problems was there was not an understanding as to who the message was actually intended for. So in addition to treating it as a domain, 
um, they said something else, which was, and in response to, and I'm paraphrasing, but in response to hacks, we'll consider responding with kinetic force. So if you don't actually specifically call out who the recipient of the message is, everybody reading it thinks it's directed to them. I read it. I thought it was directed to me. Um, and I'm going like, you know, what the heck? You know, I, I, I joke my, my buddy and I replace his, you know, his, his you know, his, uh, you know, HTML, you know, the main web page, you know, and that's considered a hack. And all of a sudden, I've got somebody launching a Patriot missile at me. I mean, this 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 makes no sense. Um, you know, what level of hack? Because if we look at like CFAA response, you know, maybe they actually think a Patriot missile is the right thing for you know defacing a website. Yeah, I I don't know. And none of these are the right questions because I'm not the intended audience. But of course, I'm reading it as as if I was. And of course, the logical next question is, wait, do they understand how attribution works? Because you know, what what if what if I do it, you know, bouncing through an ally? You know, what if I do it from within the U.S.? Are they going to kinetically respond against themselves? I mean, this is, and you kind of go, okay, wait, you know, back up. If the message were directed to, let's say, you know, other countries, other, you know, somebody in specific that's got a significant power um, that they say, look, we're talking about critical infrastructure or something of that nature, if you turn off the lights in New York, um, we'll probably be able to figure out who you are because you're not a small little hacker defacing websites and maybe there's attribution in place that we can respond to. That would have been an entirely different sort of message. And I wouldn't have read it as the whole like, wow, if I get root on something in my own system, you mean is the government going to shoot me? Um, which is just silly. But I wasn't the only person who read it that way. And it's nice having been in this field and in the hacker research community for geez, going on almost 25 years. Um, well, actually, over 25 years. And some folks were sending me, uh, they're like, hey, have you seen what's going on in the chat rooms? And there were some folks who were uh, uh, claiming affiliation or claiming support of uh, Anonymous that were going, hey, you know, have you read this? Look who's trying to prep for war in our backyards. You know, do they even understand how attribution works? This is bullshit. If they think they can find me, it's on. Let's go. And the next thing you know, there were a couple websites defaced. And they ended in like, .gov. <laughs> Now, this is where it gets kind of funky. Defacing a website is kind of a message. It's a little warning shot. But that's in a language that govies don't know. So the govies didn't get the message as far as you know what I saw. So here's the initial strategy for operating in cyberspace that goes out, probably directed to somebody else, but by poor messaging, is misinterpreted by a group. The group response fires a warning shot. The warning shot isn't understood. And it's like, hey, what are these vagabonds doing? Look at the little street punks or whatever. They're not somebody who actually has a message that we should actually engage in. And it's just this little cascading effect. So <clears throat> that's kind of unfortunately where I saw you know, the expanding of scope and, and a lot of misunderstandings. I'm not saying the two groups should be friends. Um, and I'm not saying one group is good and one group is bad. But when you send a message out into the world, and this is for both groups, you really need to make sure it's understandable by all the parties that are going to receive it. You can't assume it's just going to be read by the person you had in mind. <laughs> With all love and respect, there's one very uh, obvious commonality between the hacker research group and the government, and is that they're, they can be very arrogant and expect everybody will speak their own language and that they don't have to speak anybody else's. And I think that's a really common mistake. So the recommendation for the government, from my vantage point of both sides, is figure out how your messages are going to be received by the more general populace of cyberspace, because we all live there now. Um, this is actually a great opportunity for diplomacy. And you can kind of think of it like the lost city of Atlantis, because cyberspace kind of took them, I think, the world by surprise. Obviously, hasn't been around that long. So what if Atlantis just popped back up? and there was an advanced, very technically capable group of people there, you wouldn't sit there and ignore them. You wouldn't taunt them. You wouldn't attack them. You'd probably actually try and understand and figure out how messaging to somebody else might be interpreted to them. You might even try and figure out where you guys already you know, see things eye to eye and where you have differences. So my recommendations to the citizens of cyberspace is keep in mind that the government, and in particular the DOD, has very specific focuses and goals. And they often only see things from their own point of view because they're really focused on doing that job. 
And when you read things that appear to be a message directed to you or your community, um, coming from an unlikely source, you should question whether or not the message is actually intended for you, or if it's just intended for somebody else and really poorly worded. And if you still think a response is necessary, you really need to think about the message that you're sending to make sure that you don't make the same mistake in return. My third story is, well, let me give you a little background. I have a lot of people approach me outside of work and go, hey, um, Mudge, you, you, you know what's going on. We're all owned. And these were large companies um, that are oftentimes funded by taxpayer money. Um, I'll just say that there are large government contracting organizations. And it's like, hey, why don't you like start a program that actually pays us to go clean up the compromises or at least figure out what happened and how bad the damage was? Why isn't that your job? And it made me think that there's actually, there's not a financial incentive for these companies to actually go fix the problems. So the next question was, is the inverse true? Can government contractors actually make more money by remaining compromised and continuing to lose intellectual property? So this talk is called Game Theory's a Bitch. I was having dinner with um, a lot of these stories because I'm outside having dinner somewhere. Uh, I don't cook. <laughs> Uh, I was having dinner with an old friend, uh, and his company goes in and cleans up ABT after, you know, big well-known names uh, get compromised and what their government contractors or commercial organizations. And he posed a really interesting hypothetical, so we were just shooting the crap back and forth. And he said, hey, what do you think about the following chain of events? First, RSA gets compromised. Networks defended by their tools are vulnerable, and as a result, a defense contractor gets compromised. Said defense contractor, if you look up on Wikipedia, is the one who made this really cool stealth drone. Later, a really cool stealth drone goes missing over in a you know Middle Eastern state. What do you think about that chain of events? I'm like, that's terrifying. And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, no, no, for an entirely different reason. Look at it this way, I have no clue, but that's a hypothetical, and there were a whole bunch of rumors about what had happened. But let's assume that you, as a country or a large organization, that your advantage is technology. You can field the fastest and the best technology, so you're ahead of everybody, that's your advantage. Newest, most advanced, newest. Someone else steals some of your tech. What do you have to do? You gotta replace it with newer tech, right? You got to keep your advantage. So suppose a government contractor gets some of their super you super tech pull, and what does their government customer actually need to do? Well, the government in that case, and this is all a game theory hypothetical, need to pay someone to make the next version, so that the people who just stole it don't achieve parity, so that they're not even. They could go to some other government contractor, because of course you know the one in question just lost everything. But they actually most likely won't. And um, here's probably why. The initial contract for very expensive uh, research efforts can take a long time to put in place. You're talking over a year, uh, sometimes longer than, you know, sometimes you measure it in years rather than, than months. That was part of the coolness of CFT is that we were measuring that in days. Um, Imagine if you're under something, sequestration is what we're under now, it can take even longer. So if a government agency wanted to start a new program to replace tech, so it's essentially starting the same program to do the same thing that you were already paying somebody to do, A, it's tough to get permission to do that because you got to go justify taxpayer money and like, we just gave you the money to do that. And B, when you spin it back up, you're going to have to redo a lot of work. You're going to have to redo the contracting that you already had in place. You're going to have to spin people up to, up to speed um, uh, on management side. You're going to have to re-spin up the tech side. And you've spent years putting that in place. So why wouldn't you just go back to the people that you already have a relationship with, already have a contract with, they already know what, what they lost, or you know maybe you know what they lost and stuff, and you can tell them because they're your customer. 
So you just pay them to give you the next thing. Remember, they're not financially incentivized to go fix how they were actually compromised in the first place or clean it up. Because staying with a really familiar solution or situation is comfortable, which makes us a trap that a government funding source can actually be particularly susceptible to. And you can view this on a case-by-case -case basis and kind of staying with the co same contractor can even make sense. But if you step back and listen to what's been talked about in the media, you may see something that's a larger picture that seems like an endless list of technologies and IP being stolen. And each time it happens, that company is in a situation where, A, there's really no penalties or reprimands uh, for it. And on the contrary, they're actually rewarded with more funding. So because their customer needs to take the, make the next text to replace the stuff that just got stolen, to replace the stuff that just got stolen, to replace the stuff that just got stolen. So, yeah, game theory is a bitch because if you look at it at this angle, and part of the neat thing about game theory is you can fall into game theoretics without realizing that you're doing it. Government contractors can actually be in a situation, or are actually in a situation, that they're financially incentivized in some places not to listen to their network sysadmins and not actually to really deal with the problem, uh, perhaps the way with the drastic changes that need to be made. The fourth and kind of closing story, and maybe I'll do a fifth story about uh, Barnaby Jack in uh, Abu Dhabi. Yeah, I think I'll do that. Um, the fourth story, sorry, yeah, I just mentioned Barnaby Jack, and I just start getting a little tear. I think I might stick with just the fourth story then. Um, fourth story closing is more of a kind of plea to both the government communities and the hacker researcher communities, because from the vantage point of both. I don't have a lot of examples of our community, the hacker researcher community, really reaching out in a proactive and positive way to educate and enlighten the government. We do it, but we do it really ad hoc. And I think we need to try a little harder to do specific examples. Um, I've been a little upset about some other things in the news lately. Uh, and actually, one of your options, uh, it is a scary option, is to actually go inside and try and fix them there. People will bite you tooth and nail. It is not for the faint of heart. Um, that's actually what I did when I went over to DARPA. Uh, I didn't go there because I thought it was cool. I didn't go there because I wanted to be a part of the government. Um, I actually went there because I thought that uh, they and other parts um, of the government had kind of lost their way. And I had an opportunity to go in and fix it. I did get a really nice unofficial email from somebody recently it was about CFP, uh, which makes me think that we actually, because you guys were all a big part of that, um, did manage to pull some of that off. So I'm going to quote from this uh, email I got to my personal account. And the person said, uh, I recently had a meeting with all the agencies and uh, DOD services, and listening to them, it was my turn to be terrified because of how out of touch with reality they were with cybersecurity and cyber defenses, and it made me realize how much I and the DOD owe you, and that's us, for a cyber fast track. And here's the part where I, I was really happy. So I thought CFT was showing the government how they should be doing contracting, but now I actually understand what you were doing. It was showing the government that the re what the real state of the art is, and why they should be afraid of people on the inside who continue to just preach the status quo and throw money at the same uh, problems the same way they've done before. So that was actually pretty cool because somebody they're, they're starting to realize that. And I've heard people at high levels, uh, um, flag officers, uh, a couple pockets were starting to refer to hacker researchers as um, you know researchers. It was hacker equals researcher, not hacker equals criminal. And I thought that was really cool. It's not saying that we should go all in and support the DOD. And I'm not telling you you should like the DOD. I've got a lot of issues with the DOD. Um, uh, I'll continue. I'm sure they've got a lot of issues with me. Uh, this talk might even be one of them. Uh, but what happens there is, now that they know where some of the real ideas and some of the real talent come from, uh, they're undoubtedly going to try and reach out and tap into it in various ways. And this kind of goes back to our earlier story, where they kind of project their problems and their images and, and their goals on somebody else. So there's likely to be some uninformed and failed outreach efforts. So I've got a couple of recommendations to the government that maybe will help with that. So I think it's really cool when 
government officials throw on blue jeans and a black t-shirt um, because of course then they're part of our community no. but that's not necessarily all there is uh, to interacting with us and it makes sense before you present at a conference like this you should probably consider attending one and actually interacting and getting to know the people uh, there was one guy there was a three-star general who did that at uh, ShmooCon and I thought that was one of the coolest things and he wasn't there for any agenda and I remember conversations with him afterwards he actually had an understanding he was like oh this is awesome no, there's no way people should try and go in and mess with them or try and co-opt them or try, you know. And I was like, yeah, exactly. You know, that's us. That's that's the citizens. That's the population of the U.S. Um, so the message, you know, to the other ones who haven't really made that turn is go and actually interact. Now, the response I get was the schedule. Too crazy. You know, can't can't possibly do it. And I saw those schedules, and sometimes I was even on those schedules. But if it's important enough, I know, I know, I, I acknowledge they, they are crazy schedules. These guys work like, like bears, um, which isn't to me that they sleep for half a year. Bad analogy. As soon as I said it, I was going to say like a swear word, and bears came out instead. And anyway, um, if it's important enough for you to want to reach out to a community. You got to go out and you got to make the effort and you got to put it in your schedule and you got to go interact with them on a one on one level first because that's showing your homework and doing your homework shows respect. The next, the next suggestion to them is, um, and this is what I try to encourage inside, is you can't go out and do a recruiting pitch because it comes across really poorly. I used to get so bent out of shape when I would see a Gubby um, stand up at a hacker conference and I'm like, here it comes. We do awesome stuff, but we can't tell you anything about it. Trust us. You know, deal with the mohawk. If you, you know, shaved your hair, if you put on a suit, maybe even a uniform, stop smoking dope, you could come work for us and actually do something with your life. And it's like, that's Yikes. that's how I interpreted it. Now, that might not be the message. It might just be a, look, you know, we need help. And we're trying to reach out to you. But it's just a take, take, take sort of message. What can you do for us today? You know, what can you do for us now? And, um, you know, to me, it was offensive. <clears throat> What would it be like if you had a senior official from a very technical agency come out and actually give a technical talk? Because this is a meritocracy. That's where this community came from. And a meritocracy is your value in the community is based upon how much you contribute to that community. And that's one of the reasons why I was really happy that, because I know a lot of people are like, why the hell did Mudge go over and go to the DOD? He was one of us, now he's one of them. And I had spent 15, 20 years contributing to this community, and I wasn't about to stop. And when I was there, I was able to actually fight for this community and try and make sure that the interactions were a little bit better and that it, you know, we were treated and engaged with um, normally. And, and those 10, 15 years of contribution gave me enough grace period you know, to build trust up again on both sides. Um, and you've got to do that, and you do that by interacting with people. So the value of, of somebody in one of those agencies coming and giving a technical talk wouldn't be that you learn something really cool about how SE Linux was actually done and why it was done or what the internal battles were to get it across. It wouldn't be that somebody's going through the technical components of one of the patents, any one of the numerous patents that are out there, you know, let's say IPG allocation, you know, the ones that we've read about. It would actually be that they're engaging us and interacting with us in our own language and treating us as peers and starting a dialogue. So, I think I will get the Barney one after this, but I'm going to summarize this one here. Um, am I telling us, you know, am, am, am I pleading that, that we should not challenge the government? Absolutely not. I think challenging the government is your patriotic duty as a citizen, and I think it is very important to do. Um, it's painful for both sides, but it's something that has to happen, and that's why we're such a great nation. We also need to, I mean, you can't train a dog just by repeatedly feeding it. I mean, it'll learn some stuff, but it'll probably learn stuff that you weren't intending, and it'll bite you at some point. Um, so when you see the dog do something good, it's nice to give it a treat. And there are certain little pockets inside the government. And one of the things that I, I think that we as a community can do better 
is yes, we need to challenge the stuff that we're seeing. We need to challenge the things that are in the news. But if you see a small pocket of hope, like if you see a congresswoman that's helping um, put through Aaron's law, you know, Kate. Changing things like CFA, hey? I don't deal with losing people well. Excuse me. Somebody's going to change CFAA, we need to support them. We need to help them. We need to encourage them for actually going, because they're going to get a lot of crap thrown at them. And they're actually doing the right thing, and there's not a lot of people supporting them. So we need to be more vocal as a community to actually support them. There was a uh, colonel in the Army who managed to get the NSA to have to include Little Brother as a book that they read as part of their training. Have you read Little Brother, Cory Doctorow's? That's awesome. That helps sensitivities. That guy caught a lot of crap for that. And it was really cool. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that book. That book gives you a new way of looking at things. And the more ways you have of looking at it, the more understanding you have and the more positive outcome. Um, that guy is also, if they, currently he's over at West Point. His name is Greg Conti. I'll call him out. He was one of the people who encouraged the cadets to actually go out and talk at our conferences and contribute. So the um, UA, build your own UAV at a 99.99% you know, discount by Mike Wiegand was an example of that. And that's engaging, and that's actually sharing, and it created dialogues. At ShmooCon, uh, he and, and his colleague walked through their training course that they ran at, uh, at, at, at Fort Meade to try and socialize folks. It was Lessons of the Kobayashi Maru. I highly recommend you go watch this talk because he had to te teach them how to cheat. And it was, it's hilarious and it's insightful and it's humanizing. Most importantly, it's humanizing. So where we see those pockets of hope and of outreach and of engagement, I'd just really like to ask all of us to try and figure out a way for each time we're challenging something else to try and encourage the good behavior. Okay, so let me try and get my Barnaby one without actually breaking down into tears here. Let's see if I pull myself together. It's a real quick one, but it's my little tribute to him. Um, there's two, in, two, two things that, that ha happened, uh, interactions with Barnaby that, that I'll always remember. I mean, I remember all of the interactions, but two really stand out. One was, um, uh, a talk, uh, I was on the steering committee of NDSS, and they asked me to, if I could bring in some folks to run some demos that would kind of break the academics out of the academic mold, and, you know, what better people than uh, uh, Barnaby Jack, when he was working with EI and the rest of the EI team, to actually come in. Um, the problem is that uh, the conference, you know, like a lot of conferences, very cheap, they wouldn't pay them to come do the, uh, the work or whatever, so I said, all right, guys, you know, the drinking bill the night before is on me, I'll just put the bill myself. Um, which is a very, very dangerous thing to do. <sighs> Barnaby had a great time. Um, I don't think they went to sleep. They just kept drinking. They were on in the morning. And uh, the audience at NDSS, I don't think actually really understood how cool the technology was that was being demonstrated. Because this is almost 10 years ago at this point. And Barnaby was remotely compromising a wireless router, replacing the firmware, and then trojaning the Microsoft updates that were going through it over the wire before they were delivered to the end system. And then they were demonstrating a uh, um, boot route where they were um, uh, getting an Ethernet, so a uh, computer that was told not to boot off the network. Um, the Ethernet adapter was on the PCI board, so it had direct memory access. Uh, and it would still emit a, a, um, a boot P packet. Okay, also der Talk dauert noch ein bisschen. Um, ich bin dann mal weg. Uh, und uh, das war's dann mit der Episode. Mal sehen, ob uh, wir den in der nächsten Folge weiterschauen. Wir sind jetzt bei Minute 38. Und um, genau, das war Much Unexpected Stories from a Hacker Inside the Government. Alrighty.